place. I think that's probably what I always miss most about life is that now you understand what you're attempting to do. You understand your barriers. When you're a kid, you just rock it, man. I didn't see how I was stepping on anybody's toes, how I was taking anybody's shine. I always, it's very important that I say this. I was not very well welcome to the cast at all, okay? And I don't need to rehash that with the adults over and over and over again. They know what it was. Oh, it's called Humble Pie. <laughs> and I think Kelly and Darius and Jamie, they had issue with me, but more because of the things they were hearing the adults say. Over time, Kelly and Darius became truly my brother and sister. Even Reggie Bell Johnson, I always like to give him the credit that he deserves. That he came to realize that we were about to do this Jordan Pippen thing and it was going to change his life. And it was gonna change all of our lives for the better. So I don't ever like people to think that I have a problem with Reggie Bell Johnson or even Telma Hopkins. It was what it was. They knew more about the business than I did at that age. They understood how a dynamic was changing, but I just feel like they do deserve credit at times for having helped foster a more harmonious environment by season three, by season four, by season five. And, uh, and we did become very much a family. This is, this is funny. I'm gonna enter my world with this. This is funny to me. Joe Marie, Peyton France, who played Harriet, will always say that the show was her show because it technically was a spinoff of her character from Perfect Strangers. No, Harriet used to run the elevator, but now she's got her own show. It's called Family Matters. Watch this. However, networks play games because networks a lot of times don't necessarily believe in the star power of any one person. So Reginald Bell Johnson was hot off of this movie, Die Hard. So we have to pair her with somebody who is going to be hot too. And if you really stop and think about it, what did Reggie wear in Die Hard? He was a cop. So they weren't even very creative about it. They were like, go get the cop from Die Hard to be the cop in our sitcom. We'll tell the mom she's the star, technically. Then they go get Telma Hopkins. And knowing how networks get down now, I'm sure they're like, yo, you're technically the biggest star <laughs> in this cast. Because she was. Tony Orlando and Don, give me a break. Like, her resume was actually longer than both of theirs. So I think you had these three adults who all entered this show with the idea that this is my vehicle for me to break out. Mind you, this is a black show that's being written by all Jewish men. And so if you even listen to the dialogue in the first, like, six, seven episodes of Family Matters, some of it is really loud. Like, did Telma Hopkins just walk through the door and say, oy vey? Oy vey. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, being creative still had its constraints. And I'm sure that they, as African-American performers with, that were seasoned vets, were wrestling with just that, trying to make the show work. Then I come in, and it goes a whole nother direction. So I'll always give the, the adults credit for what they endured and the, the, and the shackles that were on them to even be entertaining. But it is what it is. You, you, you work within the box until you become the box. And that is just the way life really kind of is. My mother and father, Gail and Michael, 
were high school sweethearts of the Crenshaw District. Let's see, my dad was a bus driver. My mother worked for the post office when that was a reliable job. And they had me at a very young age. And my mother quickly assessed that my dad was working well below his intellect. And she got him a application to apply for dental school at UCLA. Back when affirmative action meant something and you could get some student loans and just create another life for yourself. My dad always wanted to make sure I played sports because he came from a very religious family where he was not allowed to play sports. And uh, so I played everything. I played baseball, basketball, football, you name it. And that was really my focus and, and my heart. But this thing started when I was three years old that was gaining more steam than any of us ever realized while we were living a very normal life. And that was acting. So I went to a preschool in the hood called Castle in the Cloud. And Miss Eva Lou, who owned the place, saw something special in me. And at that time, she just said, this kid should be in front of cameras and he should be on in commercials. And my mom's just kind of a hustler. Like, she was able to find a, a, an acting school um, to pass on to my mother. And an agent named Iris Burton on a talent scout. Uh, this is pre-internet. And she took a chance on me. She, she always liked to brag because here I was, this three-year-old kid with a giant afro, but I could read. So I remember the first job that I got was, um, was a Goodyear tire commercial. And then I did a Kellogg's commercial after that. And then my third one that really kind of got me going, I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I got a million toys at Toys R Us that I can play with. <laughs> My mom tells me that the casting lady said, oh, he's too small. He has to be able to read and memorize the song. She's in the song. And they're like, oh, yeah, hire him. OK, cool. They, so I don't even know if they hired me because of how I looked or if I just I got the song quickly. Uh, but that was my first big national commercial. And then after that, I went on to do about 50 national commercials from the time I was three until the time I was 11. One of the things I really was kind of good at, though, was I was good at reading the room. Showing appreciation with a per- When adults were happy with what I was doing or displeased. And that's kind of a sense you almost need as an actor to tweak your performances on the fly, take direction, and impress. Marker, take two. But mom, we don't have any sugar war cereal left. My agent, Iris, went on to become the most successful child agent ever. And um, if you work with Iris, you didn't do extra work. You were only a featured artist. And that's what catapults you in life, is having the right affiliation. So she saw something in me at age three that was magical. But by the time I was starting to get a little bit older, you know, uh, I got braces on my teeth. By the time I was about 10, 11 years old, I didn't know, but she was kind of done with me as an agent. And then she hired an assistant named Chris, and Chris really ended up running her business. And Chris looked at my eight by 10 and said, who's this? Back in 1989, you didn't aspire to be a star. Like, you just didn't aspire to be a television star. There was two black kids that were the stars of shows. They were both diminutive. You, do, you understood that, Gary Coleman and Emmanuel Lewis. And the only other black kids that were even super visible at this time were the Cosby kids. So you didn't aspire in your brain to be a star. I acted as a kid to make money to go to college. By the time I got to middle school, I wanted to play sports. And I wasn't booking jobs as quickly anymore because I was about to go through my awkward years and they were starting to become disruptive because I love sports so much. So my mom was having a hard time getting me to want to go on auditions anymore because I was starting to get to the age where I was starting to become more cognizant of the rejection and the time spent. 
and what it was taking time away from. But Chris believed in me, and he sent me out for a little job um, to be on Family Matters. I think the biggest moment for me accepting fame is uh, 1992 NBA All-Star Game. And this was when Magic was allowed to play in the game after he had come out with HIV. And I'm pulling up in my limo, but some kids saw me and started screaming and going nuts. And they just started rocking my limo. And I remember there were three people that had to go through the kitchen. And that was what the bellman said. He was like, man, only three people, man, get to come back through here. And he was like, you, Michael Jordan, and that MC Hammer fella. <laughs> and so it's like, for me, that was really the solidifying moment that was like, whoa, what is this? And then another moment that was actually kind of cool, though, was uh, realizing I could contact people. A producer had used me to get Laker tickets. He invited me to the Laker game, but ultimately when I got to the Laker game, I realized that he had used my name to get these tickets. And I was like, so I can call any publicity department I want if I want to like meet somebody or... And he's like, yeah, if you have their contact, Jay, sure. And I made a list. Randall Cunningham, Warren Moon, Emmitt Smith, Deion Sanders, Bruce Smith, Thurman Thomas. I remember the list like it's yesterday. And I started writing all these dudes letters. Let me introduce you to the Urkel doll. And I sent an Urkel doll with that letter to all of my favorite sports stars. And I remember for a whole season, it was like every table reading. Jaleel, you got a package from the Atlanta Falcons. Jaleel, you got a package from the, <laughs> from the Philadelphia Eagles. Jaleel, you got a package from the Buffalo Bills. And so that's when I started to understand what stardom was, this reach. But the thing was, again, I had such humble parents that they weren't trying to do a lot of the shadier stuff that people will try to do when they now have access to just open doors. Open doors. So for the Cosby Show, the network wanted Bill to have a, they wanted Bill to have two sons, but Bill only had one son in real life. And Bill pushed back and he wanted this, the cast to mirror his actual family. Uh, so that's why the character of Rudy was named Rudy because it was always intended for a boy. But it came down to me and Keisha at, at the last minute and um, Bill got his way and he got a little girl. And I remember I just bawled my eyes out. Bawled my eyes out. And my mom just came, I remember she grabbed me and she just started shaking me and she was like, if you ever react like this to not getting one of these jobs, I will take you out of the business. She didn't mean it, but it's the kind of thing that a parent has to say to try to, you know, scare a kid straight. And um, obviously not having gotten the Cosby Show was a huge blessing in my life. But I never like to say that like it wasn't a blessing for Malcolm and the other people who went on that journey. It just wasn't meant for me. Reconnecting with Mr. Cosby, I don't know if it was subconscious or what, but it just, it happened. Now you're a star like he is technically, and I fostered a relationship with Mr. Cosby separate and apart, many dinners at his house, breakfasts. Um, I even ran into a rough patch, and he's directly responsible for why I ended up at the William Morris Agency, which became an education unto itself. Um, there were really only a handful of African Americans in the 80s and 90s who shaped every film and television opportunity that has come since. And Bill, Magic, Mike, Oprah, these were like the individuals that were that. 
I actually had a, a bit of a falling out with Mr. Cosby, um, and I kept that to myself. I come from a generation where you respect your elders no matter what. And it's a tough thing to process in a generation that says it's all about what's young, it's all about what's relevant, and it's all about what's hip. So knocking off these monuments that are still human beings, um, it's, it's, it's tough. And when you go back in time and you realize how close you were to something and you put yourself in rooms where you realize his wife wasn't there, that woman was probably there for that purpose, you know, it's a hell of a hindsight thing to look at. And you don't, wanna, you don't want anyone to feel like you're trying to use it for clout. You know what I'm saying? It was like a revered man did a terrible thing and he's paying the price. It's just like, I think that's where we, where we leave it. A revered man did a terrible thing and he is paying the appropriate price. And I had tried to watch the show one time and we didn't think it was very funny. <laughs> But back then, if anybody was black on primetime TV, you stopped and you watched to see what they were going to do. And um, so I didn't think anything of it being cast to be on Family Matters because it was supposed to only be a guest spot. One off. That's it. One and done. It's actually episode 13. Either 12 or 13. I don't know. One of the two. It's called Laura's First Date in season one. Hi. The first table reading was magical, and they sat me right next to Kelly Williams. And I went right into what I did, and it just got like a really big reaction at the table reading. And even to the point where Kelly was like, where you find him? <laughs> I didn't get where you find him. Because Kelly was, Kelly was just a country girl from Maryland, man, who would always speak her mind. God, I love me some Kelly Williams. <laughs> And, uh, and again, that was one of my things that I was just developing. I didn't break character. So I got you on the hook. I see you like this laugh. And I'm just sitting there looking at her all goofy. Showing appreciation with a perfect promotional item is a meaningful gesture that can be touched, held, and enjoyed. Four Imprint can help your logo create moments that matter. Explore thousands of promotional products at fourimprint.com. Four Imprint, for certain. You and me, partner. Center of town. And, um, I think we taped on a Thursday back then. By Monday, I was hired for the rest of the season. So it took them about five to six episodes before they wrote an episode specifically for me. And that was an episode where I actually took Laura out on a date because I helped Eddie with something at school. Dr. and Mrs. Urkel. <laughs> Just practicing. And that was the episode where I really, I landed on the character. Like, I can look back at that episode. I took Laura to this French restaurant, and I love watching that episode because I'm watching myself literally, line by line, get smarter, hear this audience, milk jokes, and I leveled, that was, I leveled this French restaurant. And it was very well choreographed. Um, but, um, but there was this episode before that that was one of the ones that didn't feature me quite as much. And it was called Baker's Dozen. As a matter of fact, still first season, where Rachel gets this bright idea to turn the Winslow kitchen into an actual commercial kitchen to bake pies to sell to restaurants, and it's a big side hustle. It's going to make all this money for the family. But ultimately, the episode just ends in a food fight. So I'm watching it run through. You know, Kelly and Darius, everybody get all dressed up for the food fight. Again, I'm an athlete, I'm competitive, I'm A-type, I'm everything. I'm like, I want to throw pies at people's faces. <laughs> and I remember going to our producers at the end of the run-through, and I asked them, I was like, listen, I don't care, like, what I get to do, but can you please put me in this food fight? And I remember when the script arrived to the house, and I saw that I was in the scene, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is not how I wanted to be in the scene. And they wrote it in, the writers wrote it in, so that at the end of the food fight, Steve's goofy butt comes through the back door, and they all just look at me and just unleashed. Excuse me! I saw your lights were on. Got anything to eat? 
Oh, man. Kelly and Jamie Foxworth and Darius talk so much smack. And if you notice, if you look at that episode, <laughs> those pies are coming to my head so fast. Like, <laughs> I think they really kind of almost let out their aggression for what I was. I remember the ratings were like, you would pay attention in the top 100 shows. And Family Matters was like in the mid 50s. If you're in the mid 50s, you're probably gonna get canceled. Um, by the very end of the first season, we were knocking on top 20. So we had jumped 30 slots in nine episodes. The thing about Family Matters, which I take pride in, and I do push back kind of like an athlete, is nobody can take that from me. Some people will look at Family Matters and say, oh, he'll always be Urkel forever. Other people will look at Family Matters and they'll see the entire range of characters that were played, from Urkel to Stefan, to Myrtle, to Bruce Lee, to Elvis. And, you know, they, they see that and they appreciate it. I learned how to act. And every week was a challenge to incarnate what these writers had written. I mean, I really did even hit points of fatigue where I was like, Dave, what are you doing? Like, I got, because don't forget, I'm juggling school at the same time with this. So if you tell me I got to play Bruce Lee this week and I have a whole bunch of choreography, that just was more work for me. And Family Matters did get to the point where I was pretty much in 12 out of 12 scenes, 13 out of 14 scenes. And I remember I even had a conversation with our producers one time and I can even tell he was almost annoyed when I was asking him, like, yo, can I, can you pull back on my playing time? You know, and it was like, no. I give you the rock and I win, sucker. <laughs> what else do you need? <laughs> as good as it was, I still was not being paid like my white contemporaries. You know, the Ted Dansons, the, the Tim Allens, and the Jerry Seinfelds were all knocking on the door of a mill. And there's just, there's always been a quiet pay scale in Hollywood. From their perspective, it's not that personal. From our perspective, it's like, well, it is because you're putting a, a complexion on it, you're putting an age on it, you're putting a gender on it. You know, I always like to put things in their full context. And it's like, if you check all three boxes, you can maybe make a million an episode. My puberty was special. It really, really was my puberty. And people don't ever consider that, that you have a young man growing up from age 12 to 21 playing this character and then ultimately these characters. I remember when I did Myrtle Urkel for the first time. Well, hello there. <laughs> and I just remember, again, I get a lot of my enthusiasm from other people's satisfaction. Everybody on set that week was just amazed. I did run into an issue. Joe Marie and Reggie at that time were very sensitive to putting black men in dresses. And they, they heaped that on me. And they, they, they let me know that I was not doing our race a, a service by putting on that yellow dress. But everybody has a default. Do you crumble? Do you wilt under pressure? Do you rise? Do you surprise yourself? My default tends to be to take it up a notch. I mean, that evening, I felt like a girl. I felt like a girl playing Myrtle Lurk. But I cried like a baby at the end of that tape. I just broke. And I just cried, cried, cried. And this is what's awesome, where you have a great father. You have a good family. And my dad just rose up like a lion and was like, I've watched my son deal with this all week to pull out this performance. And he will never play this character again. You got it once, it's done. But he shouldn't have to carry the burden of some adults making a child feel bad for playing a girl just in fun. And I thought also that all my friends at school were gonna make fun of me. And 
that showing appreciation with a perfect promotional item is a meaningful gesture that can be touched, held, and enjoyed. Four Imprint can help your logo create moments that matter. Explore thousands of promotional products at fourimprint.com. Four Imprint. Instead, I got back to school. Everybody thought I was the funniest anything. And the audience reaction was huge. I even heard a rumor, and I've been told it's not a rumor, though, that an NBC executive caught the episode, created a meeting at NBC, and said, hey, they've got a black girl on Family Matters now that's just as funny as the boy. <laughs> we need to get him. We need to get him. I BS you not. Like, it's not a folk tale. And the Myrtle Urkel episode was always, which was a, there's a whole episode behind that episode that uh, I think is very poignant and I'm, I'm honored to have been a part of. Until Stefan, I had no black girl prospects. <laughs> it's the funniest thing, man. I didn't want to play Stefan. When I got the script and I went through table reading, David, our executive producer, I remember him asking me distinctly, like, what do you think? And I was like, eh, it's all right. And so um, I was as caught off guard by the phenomenon of Stefan as anyone. I really had done this show for about four or five years, not fully understanding, fully understanding that all of America thought I was this way. There is no Steve here. I'm Stefan, sweet thing. So with Stefan. Stefan or Kev. Again, I throw my heart into anything I, I do. So I knew how to play him and it, it got better. But um, I never forget hitting that living room door for his entrance in the white suit. <laughs> to this day, I just never heard a scream for me like that. And my, my instinct was to break character and be like, are you kidding me? But in that moment, I knew not to do it because I was like, something really special is about to happen to propel us through this scene. Stefan saved my life. <laughs> like, without Stefan, holy crap, what was about to happen? But at least I had Stefan and any hood I even go into. I don't care if it's a Waffle House in Atlanta or, you know, a chicken spot in friggin' Maryland. Girl, Stefan just walked in here. <laughs> and I love it. I love it to this day. Michelle Thomas, man, just became a very special person in my life and my mother's life. And um, I literally cannot say her name without crying. Ever. Anybody have a, a tissue or something? Thank you. All right. All right. It's not going to happen again. Sorry, fellas. All right. Going into the 2000s um, was really the loss of a lot of innocence. I really feel that way, strongly about it. Um, we live in an era now where people are just ferociously out to be a big deal. But there were still enough innocent characters in the 90s fame game who were just themselves, good people, everybody loved them, and they fell into this life. And Michelle Thomas is that for me. You know, um, I never had an intimate relationship with Michelle. She really was like a big sister to me. And um, Michelle Thomas was a part of my confidence building. And she made herself a part of that. And then our relationship just kind of blossomed from there. And then she would see me having little dating issues and um, yeah, she was determined to help me find the perfect girl for me. Uh, and she tried so hard, Michelle. So um, 
When the show went down, a lot of realities for a lot of us kicked in. And moving on as an actress, I think Michelle ran into some difficulty. And um, I remember even for a while, she worked as a waitress. And she would work way out, like Palmdale, because she didn't want anybody in LA seeing her. Have to wait tables. And then obviously she got stomach cancer and my mom really helped her tremendously as much as she could, but it was just too far along. And um, like I said, when you, when you know somebody's full journey, what they fought for, what they didn't ask other people for, what they didn't burden other people for, um, and that big just 34 teeth grin of hers, um, <laughs> uh, you just, anytime I mention Michelle Thomas, I just, there's a certain amount of innocence. I'm just taken back to, you know, she wasn't, Michelle had a lot of opportunities to sell her soul to the devil to start climbing a little faster. And she just wasn't that girl. She, and, and you know, you, you admire that knowing that that used to exist. You know what I'm saying? She just wasn't that girl. Yeah, no, my daughter's birth changed me at the molecular level. It just did. But once you have a child, you realize you're not living for yourself anymore. So just, I mean, some of the jobs I would either turn down or auditions I wouldn't go on, all that changed. I gotta get through this thing called private school and it is not cheap. And, you know, I don't even think people realize even as actors, if I don't work for a year, I don't get my medical benefits. How surreal is that in, in a country as wealthy as ours? So unless I want to create other entities that can provide insurance for us, and it makes sense economically, I got to work. So when you start to approach life being a parent, again, a lot of the ego and pride that you walked around with just goes away. Single dad life comes at you fast. I remember going to meet some friends. Uh, they were coming out of the nightclub. We were just going to get some food afterwards. And I remember with the ladies they were with, they were like, how many can we fit in your car? And they just opened my back seat and kind of revealed my car seat. <laughs> when your car seat gets revealed at the nightclub, it's a wrap. Whatever party you thought you was about to do, it just got shut down. Because now all these girls just got a bunch of questions. <laughs> it's wild. It's not... I remember it just put such a damper on my mood for the rest of the night. But the bigger decision that was made, uh, I was not removing that car seat. Uh, my daughter's middle name is Belle. Um, her middle name was to be chosen after a Disney princess. I picked Belle, and then when I'm upset with her when she was young, she knew it. I, I call her Belle Weezy. <laughs> um, but uh, she just, the lights are on, man. The lights are on in my daughter. Her elevator goes to the top floor. She's so capable. And I just instinctively knew at a young age to surround her with good people and give her grace. And she's gonna do what she's gonna do. Well, first of all, I want her to eclipse anything and everything I've ever done. I think that's the purpose of parenting is to raise a better version of yourself. I will say this though, I will say this. For anybody who thinks it's cute to leave a comment on my social media about her playing me in some type of reboot, dead that. That is not happening. Um, I want Samaya to have a childhood that is marked by her own decision making. The thing I love about being famous and having a child is your child don't care. It's a big deal to everybody out in the streets. I think the most flattering moment I had when my daughter recognized my celebrity fan. Showing appreciation with a perfect promotional item is a meaningful gesture that can be.
There's a definite misconception that I, I have issues with my old character. I don't have issues with any of the characters that I play. Um, I think it was an amazing exercise in acting. Um, what I do take issue with is people got to understand when you say Urkel to me, I only hear your inflection. And it's easy to be able to go through life and not have any aspect of you be polarizing. And there are very few people that get a chance to live that existence. You really stop and think about it. Where it's like, if you just say Michael Jordan, it's like, oh, winner, championship, great shoes, billionaire, good looking guy. Like, very few people get a chance to live a completely non-polarizing existence. So that's, that's my polarized. Not everybody was a fan of the show. Um, Family Matters actually kind of gets beat up in polls amongst African-Americans. Um, a lot of African-Americans don't feel like our show kept it real enough. Um, I think in retrospect, if you look a little more closely, you'll see that we did episodes about the N-word, about police harassment. Um, but not to knock these other shows, because I'm fans of them also, but you know, we're just in the black community. We aren't Martin and Living Single. You know, they just, they just kept the dialogue a little more authentic. And so because of that, they're more well-received in the long term by the black community. But our show performed better globally. And sometimes when you perform better globally, there's a pop culture backlash. Isn't it weird? Like, you can become too big. Like, oh, that's commercial. I take that on the chin because I just know that's my people being tough, and that's my people, you know what I'm saying? That's no different than trash talk on a basketball court or whatever, a barbershop talk. You know, I'm not gonna make that, I'm not gonna allow that to make me see my people any differently. I know what we are, um, but it's nice in hindsight to get some love that I'm seeing right now on Twitter or social media where I'll get, you know, a black person in particular saying, hey man, Family Matters did a lot for black folks. Like, damn right we did. And, uh, and its characters left us with a really good, you know, left a really good positive lineage to look back on. What is it, 20 years later? The show ran from 89 to 98. It's 2020? It's crazy. The internet has opened up that you can make a lot of things now and you can just share your content with the people. And it's fantastic and I love it. There's still another level of filmmaking, and I'm seeing it even behind me right now, that is real. It requires a budget, it requires good producers, it requires people that understand what it is to come together and meet all the regulations that are necessary to create great content on a high, high, high level. And I've experienced a lot of setbacks, a lot of triumphs, um, and Ultimately, the thing I'm most proud of is that I'm still here, and I'm, I still feel very well preserved. Like, I always wake up to say, I'm not crazy. Like, I see people losing their minds, and I see people, you know, giving in to life's pressures and temptations, and, you know, it just, it, it can happen over time, and it can happen in the most subtle ways. Uh, I see women carving themselves up, trying to stay young, and it's like, baby, don't do that. Just, just do that with grace. You know what I'm saying? It was like, so any number of stories that I have where about a job or a deal that I got passed for or didn't get, that's in the past. It helped me just be a better person for right now. And I think it's very important to move forward in life and leave your baggage behind.